I want to share with you uh, a story, and the title you see up there is The Unknown Missionaries. And to really understand this, I'm also the Old Testament teacher at Fairview, so the Old Testament's going to leak into every, every time I talk. Uh, that's okay. But the story of the Bible, sometimes when, when people think about the Old Testament, they think of uh, the sacrifices and, and the temple and more of a judgmental God. There's even a book out there by an atheist named Richard Dawkins, and he opens his book called The God Delusion with a paragraph that talks about how evil and horrible the God of the Old Testament is. And it is for that reason that he does not partially believe in a God. That is, that is a, a very, very strong misconception because from the very beginning of the scriptures, while God is a God of judgment and holiness, he is also over and over again a God of wonderful grace. And it is that God that, that is writing the story of missions. You think of even in the garden, God created uh, the, the man, and he saw that man was uh, alone. And so out of his grace, he made woman. And then he, he put them in this garden. He offered them so many different things. He did give them one restriction, and they indeed, we know, they took from that tree of knowledge and so God had to come and to judge them. But in his, even in his judgment, in even his, his punishment of them, he offered to them the promise that the seed of the woman would one day defeat the serpent. Even in judgment, God offered grace. A few chapters later, we have the story of Cain and Abel. And we know that Cain killed his, his brother. And, and God put a curse onto Cain. And that overwhelmed Cain in Genesis chapter 4. God even then protected Cain. In Genesis 4, verse 15, you go look it up sometime. God protected. He said if he put a mark upon Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. Even in the punishment of the first murderer, what did God do? He extended grace. And when God determined to flood the earth, it says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, but God didn't flood the earth right away. For hundreds of, uh, over 100 years, Noah built the ark and regularly preached and shared about the hope that was to be found in the ark is God's grace. And you can trace that. We don't have uh, a full Old Testament survey class, but over and over and over again throughout the scriptures, while we do see the punishment and the judgment of a righteous God upon the sin and the consequences it brings, Every time, God also offers grace. And ultimately, that had to be satisfied by when he sent his son Jesus to live as a human and then ultimately to die on a cross. It was the ultimate union of judgment and grace combined into one single event that we will celebrate here in another month of, on Resurrection Sunday. But after that, and it's been referenced a few times in the book of Matthew, as, as Jesus is leaving earth, he issues this, what we call the Great Commission. And, and he sends his followers out, uh, the tw the, well, 11 at that point, and, and then the many others who aren't named, who are followers, that he was going to send them to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, that brings us then to the book of Acts, because the book of Acts is where we, we get to see that story unfold. But unfortunately, the, the command for Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth, even so soon after Jesus left, they didn't do very well with that process. We see in the early chapters of Acts, and once again, you can go study this more later. I'm covering a lot of territory to get to where we're going. But we see that God moved and he sent his Holy Spirit, and many believers started to come to, to join the church there in Jerusalem. But there was a struggle to move beyond the boundary of the comforts and home of Jerusalem. And we watch this, this take place as people are getting saved and we have the church growing and uh, Acts chapter 5, there's, there's things that happen to, to move it along. And we get to chapter 7 where this young man, Stephen, preaches a great sermon, but then he is killed 
And in Acts chapter 8, we have the beginning of a growing persecution. In Acts 8, verse uh, 1, it says, At that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was what? At Jerusalem. And so they were spread where? <clears throat> Judea and Samaria. See, what had happened was God said, you need to go from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria. Well, they weren't doing very well. So what did God do? He said, I will help you on your journey. So I'm going to bring persecution. And it was persecution that moved the believers outside the confines of Jerusalem. And now you say, well, that's great. Now they're going to spread the gospel. That's not really what happens. Now we do, in the rest of Acts 8, we have this man named Philip. Now Philip is an excellent man of God, a great missionary. I encourage you to study his story. But there in Acts, he goes to Samaria, and he shares the gospel. At the end of Acts 8, he shares the gospel with this man from Ethiopia, from Africa. He shares the gospel with him. That's wonderful. Philip is a great example but the missionary movement of the church is not one man doing all the work. Right, Pastor? It, the, the work of the spreading of the gospel was not going to happen from one super missionary going out and doing this work. God wanted the church Amen. to go. Amen. So Acts 8, Philip's doing a great job, but nobody else is doing anything. So this is not enough. And that brings us to the passage that was read earlier. Well, even in Acts chapter 10, Peter really has to be really kicked out the door by God to go share the gospel with the Gentiles. We have this whole thing with the sheets, and we're not going to go into all those details, but eventually God, through Peter, brings the gospel to the Gentiles. When we come to the end of Acts 10, the gospel has gone kind of to Samaria, kind of to the Gentiles in the uttermost parts of the world, but just a few people. But Acts 11 is where everything changes. And we come to Acts 11, verse 19 that was read. And this is where things really get exciting. Because it's going to pick back up where we left off in Acts 8. It says, They which were scattered abroad, the persecution about Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Phenice, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word to everybody, right? It's not what it says. It says, only the Jews. Oh, no. They're still not getting the message. See, God said, go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the other parts of the earth. God used persecution to move into those places. So now they're in the uttermost parts of the earth. And what do they do? They just hang out with other people like them. Right? So God has moved them to different places but they only go and hang out with and talk with and, and share with the people like themselves, the other Jews in this area. Uh, this happens to this day all over the place. Uh, if you travel even to the U.S., you know where you will find Jamaicans? A lot of times living in like communities and stuff and, and areas. And it's not just Jamaicans. Many countries around the world, when their people move to other countries, they gather in certain locations. Now, that is normal, and it's understandable to, to, to gather and to hang out with people you know and feel comfortable with. But that is not the church that God envisioned. He envisioned a church that was going to be uncomfortable for the sake of the gospel. And that is where we get the heroes of Acts 11, verse 20. And pay attention. It says, some were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they came to Antioch, spake unto the Greeks, preaching the Lord Jesus. Some of these men. Now notice, where were these men from? Not Jerusalem. See, these were people who had been from other countries, had come to know Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. Now when they are spread out to these other places because of persecution, they look around and say, you know who else needs the good news of the gospel? The Greeks do too. Hmm. So in Antioch, we have these people. 
Now, what is their names? We don't know. And that is why they are called the unknown missionaries. What we know is where they're from. One place they're from is Cyprus. Anybody know where Cyprus is? Cyprus is a small island. It's actually a little smaller than Jamaica. It's about 3,500 square miles, whereas Jamaica is over 4,000 square miles. So here in Antioch, some of these missionaries are men from a small island. Now, also, some are from Cyrene. Does anybody know where Cyrene is? You know, sometimes we read these words in the Bible, but we never stop and look where they are, right? Cyrene is from the north coast of Africa. And so, the, the men who are sharing the gospel in Antioch with the Greeks, the people who are really going outside the confines of comfort, are people from a small island and from Africa. Do you guys realize that? The people who changed the church, and you see there, we know they changed the church because in verse 21, it says the hand of the Lord was with them. Amen. And a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Bless God. See, we, we see the hand of God. Now, you see the hand of God frequently in the Old Testament. Uh, that phrase is used all throughout the Old Testament and, and judges as the hand of the Lord was against them or, or things like or the hand of the Lord was with them. We don't see it often in the New Testament until we come to this point. And it arises, the hand of the Lord shows up when men from a small island in Africa, because of persecution, travel to Antioch and there they share the gospel with non-Jews. And when they do that, the hand of the God is with them. And a great many believe. Now remember, Philip, who was Philip talking to? A couple guys in Samaria, one guy from Ethiopia. Peter went to one guy's house in uh, Cornelius' house. And that's great. But here in Antioch, a group of people from a small island and from Africa began to share the gospel with everybody, not just Jews, but the Greeks as well. Everybody who's in Antioch, they share the gospel with. And it is at that point when God does something amazing and a great number start to turn. And we saw great numbers turn to God in Jerusalem. That was great. But we need great numbers to turn to God in every city. That's right. And it is there in Antioch, and it happens because regular people, who we don't even know their name, to this day, they are unnamed there in Scripture. Now, I'll, I'll give you a sneak peek of who they might have been, but at this point, we don't know who they are. But something amazing is happening. And every time something amazing happens, what happens? Some people get a little skeptical, right? So in verse 22, it says, The tidings of these things came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem. And they're like, well, we're not real sure about this. We hear about something going on in Antioch, and we're not there. None of the apostles are there, so how could God be doing something amazing in Antioch when none of us apostles are here? Now, I'm, I'm reading in. That's not actually what was said. But that was the kind of the idea. Jerusalem is where the apostles were. They stayed despite the persecution. And all these people moved out, and then they hear rumors. You know, they see WhatsApp statuses of these great church services going on in Antioch, right? And so they grab this man Barnabas to go and check it out. They say, go and see what is happening. And verse 23 tells us that he came to Antioch, and what did he see? The grace of God. Remember I told you that the grace of God is woven through all of Scripture? He came, and he saw the work of the grace of God. And he was glad, and he encouraged them that they should cleave unto the Lord. Continue what you are doing. You are doing a good work here in Antioch. And you know what he did? He didn't go back to Jerusalem. He decided to stay in Antioch. All right, this is a man from the big mother church in Jerusalem. He was sent to Antioch just to check out what God was doing. Is God really doing something there, or is this kind of a, hmm. eh, I'm not really sure what's going on. That happens to this day, right? We hear about great movements or other things, and we get a little skeptical, right? Because that's not our experience. How could God do amazing things somewhere else? Well, he does. 
And it's amazing. And Barnabas goes and he sees it and he decides to stay. And verse 24 says, many people were added to the Lord. So more and more people are coming to the Lord here in Antioch. And Barnabas is like, you know what? I know somebody who needs to be at this church, right? So he went out and invited a friend. And what friend did he invite, if you look there? A man named Saul. All right, this is a guy who had been killing Christians. Now, the Christians who came to Antioch were there because of what? Persecution, Persecution specifically from whom? Saul. Saul. All right, so you're at this church. God's doing great things. You're here because this guy was killing and imprisoning your family and your friends. And who walks into church one day? Saul. And you're like, Barnabas, I know we say anybody can come to church. But did you really have to bring Saul to our church? But that's what's amazing, because the church in Antioch was uh, built yeah. upon the idea that everybody gets to hear and share the gospel and the glory of the grace of God. So Saul, the man who was persecuting Christians, the reason the church in Antioch exists is because of persecution, and it is to that church that Barnabas brings Saul. And it is there that Saul learns and grows. It says, for a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. Paul is there learning and growing and sharing with these men from a small island and from Africa who had founded this church. Now, when we think of Saul who became Paul, what do we think of? The great apostle, the missionary who wrote much of our scriptures and who changed the world. Do you know where he was discipled and he learned and he grew? From a bunch of people we don't know their names in Antioch. And it's because there was a different spirit in that church that we get verse 26 that says the disciples were first called what in Antioch? Christians. Christians. Christians is a term that we throw around casually these days. It's just a word everybody knows. People apply it to all sorts of different things and people, right? But at this point, it was special. It was a phrase that means they are like the Christ, the Messiah, the one who came and died. That name was first attached not to the church in Jerusalem, not to the apostles, not to all the people we see early in the book of Acts, not to Peter, right? It was to these unnamed people from a small island in Africa who had started a church with which God was working by sharing the gospel with everybody, not just the Jews. And now it is there the name Christian first arises. Mm. See, already this little part of the Bible should awaken our eyes and our hearts to the idea that God is able to do a great work in a church, not when one person is doing all the work. Because we have three chapters of Philip and Peter right. doing amazing things for God. But they're one, two men. The work and the change that God is going to do that's going to affect communities and cities and the world is done when all members of a church, even so many that they couldn't name them all, are out sharing the gospel with everybody. And that is what happened in Antioch. That is what happened to, to bring Barnabas, who then brought Saul who, who should not have been accepted, but he was, and he was loved. And you say, well, what happened because of this church? We'll flip over then one chapter to Acts 13. And now we come back to the church in Antioch. And here in just a few verses, we kickstart what is the missions movement. So there's a church that was in Antioch, certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, who we know. Simeon, that was called Niger. You guys know what the word Niger means? That's black. Uh, he was a black man. Lucius of Cyrene. Where, remember where was Cyrene? That's in Africa. Menaean, who is a Greek man, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch. So this is a guy who had grown up in politics. And Saul. So this is a group of people. And we find out that as they ministered to the Lord and they fasted, 
The Holy Spirit said, separate Barnabas and Saul for the work I've called them. They fasted, they prayed, they laid their hands on them, and they sent them away. And the rest of the book of Acts moves to the story of the gospel being taken to the rest of the world. And it's a story of the growth of the church to places like Ephesus and Laodicea and Thessalonica and Colossae and all these places that we, then we get the letters from later and that initiate the beginning of the gospel movement westward and throughout the rest of the world. Where did that come from? From this church in Antioch, which had been started by a few unnamed missionaries from a small island and from Africa who were willing to do what? Not something grand or majestic or difficult. They merely shared the gospel with people that others wouldn't. That's it. Acts 11 merely says they were willing to tell of that story with others who were not the Jews. They shared with the Gentiles, and it was because of that action that God initiated the process that brought you and me here. That's right. The spread of the gospel throughout the world began with some unnamed people from a small island in Africa. And as we sit here today on a mission Sunday, you can think of the world and all the things that are going on, the difficulties and the challenges and the limitations. But Acts 11 helps us to realize the fact that God did something amazing not in the book of Acts by signs or miracles. Those are in the book of Acts. But you know where it started? A few people who are just willing to share the gospel with somebody else. It is that willingness that God used to write the rest of the book of Acts and the rest of human history, the growth of the church that continues to this day. And it is that that then you and I are invited to participate in. And you may say, my name might not go down in the, the pages of history. That is okay. We, we pray for missionaries, and it would take us days and weeks and months to tell you stories of all the missionaries in the past and the ones right now. It, it, it's overwhelming. But it all exists because a few men were willing, in their going, to share the gospel with others. That's right. That's right. And if there's nothing else that you take away from today, I want you to be comforted by that idea that the movement and the growth of the church was not done by the superstar apostles. Now, God used the apostles, and they did great things, and we need our pastors. We need even designated missionaries or evangelists. The, the church needs those people. Ephesians tells us that. But the hand of the Lord worked when regular people got involved in the spread and the sharing of the gospel message. And it is from that realization, that passion, that reminder that I, I want to call on all of you to be reinvigorated with the potential for God to use you. You know, I, I even think of, I, like I said, I love the Old Testament. There's another unnamed missionary in the Old Testament who sometimes we forget about. And she is someone who didn't intend to go, right? So when Israel was struggling and not doing well, at one time a nation called Syria invaded. And in that invasion, one young girl was taken away and removed from her home and taken to this foreign land called Syria. Mm -hmm. To this day, we don't know her name. That's right. But she was taken, and in her going, you know what she decided to do? She told her master of the true God. That's right. Her master just happened to be this powerful general named Naaman. And when he needed healing, when he was broken, when, when everything that he thought was important was gone, his little maid, who, who had been, he had taken away in captivity, she was willing to do what? To share with him the hope and the grace that is found in the God of Israel. What did Naaman do? He traveled, and he thought he was big, he was important. He went to the king. The king says, I don't know what to do with you. He said, you need to go see the prophets. He went to see the prophet, and the prophet wouldn't even come out and talk to him. This was challenging Naaman's pride. Go wash in the dirty Jordan River. He didn't want to do it, but eventually he did, and he went down into the Jordan River seven times, and he came up a cleaned man. But he was not just a clean man. He was what? He was a changed man. And he ran back to Isaiah, and he says, my life is different. I don't want to live like the rest of it. I want to give you all these gifts and prizes. I say, don't do that. 
And, and Naaman said something amazing. Go back and read the story. I don't know if you, do you know what he asked for? I heard it back here. He said, can I take some dirt from Israel home with me? Because it is here where the presence of God dwells. This man who was mighty and great went back to his country and, and he was a man of God and he took dirt from Israel with him. His identity was majestic, powerful, general, and now his identity is tied to dirt. Why? Because a little girl who we don't know her name was willing to speak of the God of Israel. She didn't have a powerful degree. She didn't have, she wasn't a preacher. She wasn't a speaker. She wasn't trained in anything. But you know what she do? The God who had the power to change lives. And it changed the life of this great general. So much so that he made his identity a couple bags of dirt. We want to see that in the lives of the people around us, right? What it takes is sharing the story. And so what I want to do is I want to finish, because sometimes the whole Christian thing and the story and the gospel, we, we hear it, we think about it, we sing about it, and we forget the wonder of it. And so what I want to do is as I finish, I want to reframe the story of the entire Bible in a totally different way you might not have heard before. Maybe you have. But I want you to realize that the Bible is more than just a series of stories and lists and miracles and things, but it is a wonderful story of God. So let me, let me just have you think about Genesis and Revelation. In the garden, God put the humans, he, he, this man and the woman he created, and into that garden he put many, many trees. And he told them, you may eat from what? Any tree of the garden except for one the tree of knowledge of good and evil. We tell that story, we forget that in the garden there was another special tree. What was that tree? It was called the tree of life. And the fruit from that tree would give eternal life. See, we forget about that. Could they eat from the tree of life? Yeah. All the trees you can freely eat. So they had a tree from which they could eat and gain eternal life. What tree did they choose? They chose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God says, because of my grace, because they are now sinful human beings, I and my love do not want them to what? Eat of the tree of life. See, in the garden were two trees. And because they pursued the one that gave them their own knowledge, God had to remove them from the one that gave them life, the one that was freely available to them. But in their pride and their desire, rather than taking the freely available life, they pursued, in opposition to God, their own pride and knowledge. And thus humans were removed from the two trees. But remember... We serve a God of grace. If you flip in your Bible to the end of the Bible, in, in Revelation, the very last chapter, and, and in Revelation 21, we're, we're being introduced to this, this new Jerusalem, this, this place that is coming down. It's got these beautiful walls and these pearls and the gold and, and all the things we, we, we read about. And in Revelation 22, John is up there, and then he sees, and we find out there in 22 verse 1, he showed me a pure river water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and the Lamb, and the midst of the street of it on either side of the river was there what? The tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree for, were, were for what? The healing of the nations. So in the garden, because man pursued a knowledge, God had to remove them from the tree of life. But God took that tree of life, and he picked it up in his hand. He preserved it, and he has placed it waiting for all eternity future to be reshared again with humanity, to, to seek of and to pursue the healing of the nations. Do the nations need healing? Absolutely. 
You don't need to pick up a newspaper anymore to read that. You can find it in any YouTube stream or anything, the, the horrors and the terrors and the difficulties going on in our nation and every nation. And God has marked and set aside the tree of life, which is for the healing of the nations. But there must always be two trees. The tree of life was freely available, but man took from a different tree of a, their own knowledge. And so God moved the tree of life to eternity future, and he's offered it, and he's placed it there for us to share and to look forward and hope for. But how do we get, once again, to the tree of life? Well, sin came at a tree, so too must restoration. That's right. And so it was Amen. that only during the time of the Romans... People who, who mastered and crafted the killing of humans on what? A tree that our Jesus came to live and to be born while his nation was under oppression by these Roman people. You say, why was that? So that when it came time for him to die, he was not allowed to be killed. How did you kill people in the Old Testament? They threw stones at them, right? But God engineered human history so at the time when Jesus was to die... He was to be accursed. Curse is anyone who what? Hangs on a tree, the Old Testament. And so to get back to the tree of life, our Savior was hung and died on a tree. The Bible is a story of two trees. The tree of life, which God desires to give to you and to me, to your friend, your family, your coworker, the person that you know, God wants them to once again to share of the tree of life, which he had freely offered to people in the past. But humans seek their own knowledge over the freely offered gift. And so Jesus had to then come and die on another tree so that through his sacrifice, through the restoration coming at the, at the foot of another tree, his life and his blood gathered and was shared for you and for me so that we could once again share the healing of the nations at the tree of life. That's the story we have been given. Isn't that amazing? The, the, the Bible from the beginning to end has so many woven, intersecting stories of grace and love, but judgment, and it all is wrapped up in these two trees. The story you and I need to come again today as we leave here, if you know Jesus Christ and you have put and your knee down at the foot of his tree, at the cross, and you've given him your life, you now look forward once again to that tree of life. But it's not just for you. It's for the healing of the nations. Right. And so for you and for me, the charge for us is to be like these unnamed missionaries. And, and as we go, they were scattered not because they wanted to. I know some of you probably, well, maybe not tomorrow, but some of you might not have work tomorrow, but some of you this week might not want to go to school or to work every day, right? Maybe, maybe you all are wonderful people. You love going to work every day or wherever it is. But in your going, we have a story to share with people. These, these unknown missionaries from Acts 11 didn't intend to leave Jerusalem. They were chased out by someone seeking to kill them. But as they went, they said, you know what? Everybody needs to hear this story of the hope that is found in the two trees. And so they shared that story. Some of you, I don't know what your life holds. Maybe God's going to take you and leave you in this community. Maybe God will move you somewhere. Maybe God will take you to another country. As God takes you, or if you pursue to go, do it with the idea that you carry with you the hope of the tree of life. You carry with you that hope and share it with everybody, even the people like Saul who may not deserve it. But maybe you're here today, and, and as you hear the story of the two trees, you have continued to pursue, to seek your own knowledge. You're like humans since the beginning of time. You crave to be self-sufficient, to knowledgeable, to be uh, dependent upon who you are and, and you are the master of you. No one else tells you what to do. And so you live by the tree of knowledge. But the tree of knowledge does not allow access to the tree of life. The tree that you must come to is the cross upon which Jesus Christ died. 
He had access to the tree of life. He had access to all glory and all power. He gave that up for you and for me to ask us, he to offer to us freely his love and his grace if we will accept him, believe in him, and follow him. I'm going to have you just 